sure if it's around here. Oh, okay. I think Eddie's falling. We would like to invite everyone to come close to the tent as we begin the services for a good friend, brother, father, grandfather, brother Baron Edmund Cowan. Dear God, We recognize that this world is not our home and that one day soon you're going to come and break through the clouds to a time where there'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying and no more pain. But until that day comes, we're waiting for you to fulfill, we're going to ask you to fulfill another promise. One that says you would be with us and never leave us nor forsake us. God, we lift up Sister Cowan and the Cowan family. God, that you wrap your arms around them. That you'll whisper in their ears that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Bless us as we remember his life and his love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On behalf of the Cowan family, we'd like to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your schedule, some of you traveling miles to get here as we celebrate the life and the legacy of Brother Baron Cowan. I'm quite sure that if we were not in this COVID pandemic, that the Oakwood University Church Sanctuary would be filled to capacity, recognizing the impact that Brother Cowan made on our church and our community. Sister Cowan, we're here today to show our love and our support to you. We'd like to thank those who are viewing 
virtually through the Oakwood University Church YouTube channel. Our program is not long because it's not so much the quantity but the quality. But I'd like to share with you what will transpire those who are viewing so that you might be able to adequately follow along with what is transpiring here in Huntsville. Our prayer of comfort was given by Dr. Toussaint Williams, one of our staff pastors at the Oakwood University Church. For those who are viewing and don't know, I'm Dr. Carlton Bird, the senior pastor of the Oakwood University Church. And we will have reflections by Mr. Gilbert Cooper, Sabbath school teacher of Brother Cowan, Ainsworth Thomas, friend of the family, Brendan Lewis, friend of the family, Sarah Faria, friend of the family, and then Dr. Howard Weems, former pastor. After these five individuals share reflections, we will have the reading of the obituary by Brenda Lewis, followed by a special hymn under his wings that we will sing as a congregation collectively. And then yours truly will offer the words of comfort, the committal, followed by the benediction and closing prayer from Dr. Toussaint Williams. This is our order. This is how we shall proceed. I ask in a special way that for the five persons who will render reflections, that you be mindful of time parameters as we don't want to overtax the family. Moreover, here in Huntsville, the Lord has smiled on us this day with sunshine, but the weather is still a bit cool. And so with that, we do not want to extend beyond a sense of normalcy when you give remarks. But also, we're still in a COVID-19 space, and we do not want this service to be a super spreader event. Thank you so much to our persons who will give reflections, who will be mindful of these tidbits of love. We will begin now with reflections from Mr. Gilbert Cooper, Sabbath School teacher. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Bird. To Sister Cowan and family, we, class number 13, extend our deepest sympathy during this difficult time. And to you, Eddie, your classmate, your Pine Forge classmate, our son, sends his deepest sympathy as well. Thanks for allowing me to speak a few words in memory of our friend and class member. So <clears throat> what stands out in my mind about Brother Cowan? He was a faithful Sabbath school class member. He was faithful in his attendance. He recognized the importance of the study of the Word of God and the importance of spiritual growth that comes from sharing and fellowshipping with others. On those rare occasions when he and Sister Cowan were not present, they were missed, and we knew there was a good reason for their absence. Brother Cowan was always ready and willing to contribute to the lesson study. He was a student of the Word of God. His reflections from time to time on his conversion from Catholicism to Adventism and his understanding of the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 provided great insight into this last day message. Brother Cowan was a people person. He had a heart for young people and young adults. He would always ask us about our children. 
He wanted to know how they were doing. When he would see them, he always spoke words of encouragement. On one occasion, a young couple entered the church seeking one of the pastors. He took time to become acquainted with them and directed them to where they needed to go. This began a lasting friendship with them. Brother Carwin recognized that this world is not his home. In the words of Hebrews 11.10, he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He looked for a city where pain will not exist. He looked for a city where there will be no sickness, no tears, no mourning, and no more separation. As we bid our farewell and look forward to the resurrection at the second coming of Christ, we say to the family and friends, in the darkest days when appearances seem most forbidding, have faith in God. He is working out his will, doing all things well in behalf of his people. The strength of those who love and serve him will be renewed day by day. Sister Cowan, family, and friends, may God renew your strength, bless and comfort you until we are reunited with Brother Cowan in the city whose builder and maker is God. It began for me many moons ago when Mr. Baron Cowan entered my life. It started with a simple introduction from his son, Eddie. Mr. Cowan struck me as a friendly man and in, on further conversation discovered he shared a birthday with my own father. From there, a relationship and friendship began that ultimately led to an informal adoption of Mr. and Mrs. Cohen as my mom and dad, as my biological parents were both deceased. Dad was a truly caring and loving man who loved my children as though they were his own grandchildren. He called my eldest son Sherwin, my number one prince, and then Michael and Alicia, the princess. He was well loved by my family and his family truly became our adopted family. Over the years, we have shared many special occasions, including yearly Thanksgiving dinners and Christmas, our children's weddings and our grandchildren's dedication. His thoughtfulness was exhibited in countless ways. There are several momentous mementos in my home that were hand-picked gifts from dad just because he saw something while he was out shopping that he thought I would like and appreciate. And since he was a man of many talents, he worked on several projects in my home and yard, including repairing the fence that the neighbor's tree <laughs> had damaged. As any good father would for his daughter, he will help with these projects. Dad was known for his outgoing and friendly nature. As mom can attest, many Sabbaths after church, she'd be waiting patiently for him in the car for extended periods of time while he socialized with friends or maybe people he had just met. Of him it could be said that he never met a stranger And some of the people whom I consider dear friends today are people that dad introduced me to. We will miss him dearly, but I know that one day we will see him again on what he often referred to as that great getting up morning. May God bless the family.
Hello, my name is Brendan Lewis. Um, what can I say about my grandpa? Like, it's like he had a sort of sense, like no matter where you were, he could find you. Like he just knew you were there. And like, even some Saturdays when I came to church or when I was at the church or doing different things and I didn't feel like talking to anybody, he would come up and he would give you that hug, like his hug. He would like, just like that grip he had, the handshake, the hug, like everything. Like he just knew, like he really cared about you. He would ask about the family. He would ask how I was doing in school. Um, he would just ask different things about me and he was genuinely interested. And you could tell like he wasn't just asking it just as normal conversation. He really wanted to know what I had going on and what was going on with the family. And you could really feel the genuine energy coming from him. Like he, I don't know. I just don't like, have a really good relationship with my actual grandpa and he was just actually there for me like I just actually looked at to I looked up to him as like my actual grandpa like he was been there since I was at his house playing the rescue figures going over to <laughs> Auntie Hildora's damn we just going back and forth Sabbath dinner like that was family like I didn't I've never seen it any different like it's always been them like and I really appreciate him because that hug, like those different things, like him asking him being just like caring about me and different things, like even the days when I didn't feel like, like feel like being here and different stuff like that hug and just like different stuff, the Sabbath and just like be, him seeing him at church, it was, it was really a lot. Thank you. Condolences to the Cowans, Sister Cowan, Eddie. Uh, I represent my family and I. As you know, my journey with Brother Cowan started long ago. Actually, it started in the late 1990s uh, when I was assigned to the Bethesda SDA Church on Long Island, New York. Eddie, probably where you grew up. Uh, we had a church school there. And upon my appointment to this particular church, Brother Cowan or the Cowans were the first to greet, to meet and greet my family and I. And my children still remember uh, to this particular date. Uh, and there are several things that I notice about Brother Cowan that I want to bring out. Uh, because to me, they are Christ-like characteristics and I can tell that he was on a journey with the master. Um, there are three things I want to bring out. Number one, he was committed to his family. He said to me, Pastor, I purchased some property in Alabama, in Huntsville, and I want to move there. Uh, and I think I'll be moving there in a few months or so. And sure enough, he did move, and he also added, I'm going to build me a retirement place uh, right there next to my son. Uh, that afforded him the opportunity to be next to his family. So he was a committed family man. And number two, he was committed to the church. And this really blew me away. That level of commitment is rarely seen by someone who's not on the payroll. And so he would stay to the end to take care of business at the church. And when I arrived at Oakwood University, I could still see that level of commitment. Uh, although he weren't feeling, he was not feeling that well, he would still perform his duties. And I can see it in his eyes that he was struggling and challenged with his health in the final days of his life. But he executed his task. Although he took a seat, he had to rest periodically, but he executed his task. And maybe you can find comfort in the memories of him. For the Bible says, blessed are the dead in Christ, they that die in the Lord, for their works do follow them. It doesn't say that the memory followed them. And so maybe you can find hope 
uh, in his attitude uh, because lastly he was committed to the Lord Jesus Christ and this could be seen in the way that he made you feel welcome you know so take hope in the fact that one day we all will gather around the welcome table and the earth made new and Jesus will make us feel welcome. John says, I saw the holy city descending from God out of heaven, adorned of the bride for a husband. So we have hope today. We have hope that we will meet Brother Cowan again if we are faithful. So my mind is fixed on that day when Jesus say to us, shall say to us, well done that good and faithful servant. You've been faithful as Brother Cowan, and that which is least, but I'm going to make you rule over that which is much. So take hope, take encouragement today, and look forward and anticipate that day when our Lord and Savior shall return. God bless you. It's a privilege and an honor to be able to hear, to be here to speak for Dad Cowan today. The place is Buff Bay, Portland, on the beautiful island of Jamaica, in the Caribbean Sea of the West Indies. On the 16th day of August in the year 1939, Baron Edmund Cowan was born into the world to Hubert and Mary Johnson Cowan, the first of two children to this couple. Barron matriculated through elementary and secondary school on the island of Jamaica. He then learned the trade of tailoring and designing. Upon coming to the United States, he continued his education by receiving an associate's degree in HVAC, heating, ventilation, and air condition from the State University of New York at Farmingdale. Many people knew Barron as a jack of all trades, and he used those God-given talents to serve others in his manifestation of the Lord's work. Barron was very passionate about education, especially Christian education. When he talked to young people, he would ask them how they were progressing towards their educational goals. He was consistent in providing motivation and encouragement towards growth and was happy to celebrate each success with praise. Barron was introduced to the Seventh-day Adventist SDA faith as a young man in his 20s by the Burnett family, whom he affectionately called his SDA parents. It was during a missionary volunteers, commonly known as MV, camp in Jamaica, when he first laid eyes on a young lady named Vita Milligen and made sure they became acquainted. As is typical for young people, their paths strayed, but they reconnected years later at Bethel SDA Church in Brooklyn, New York. On July 5th, 1970, the two became one in marriage. Soon after their one and only child, Edmund Barron was born, and the family moved from Brooklyn to Long Island, New York, Amityville, and put and began to put down roots. Avid to their faith, they became active members of the Bethesda SDA Church and were members for 26 years. In 1999, they made the move from New York to Huntsville, Alabama, where they joined the congregation of the Oakwood University Church. Baron and Vita spent 50 and a half years of marriage in laughter and love. 
in the still hours of the morning on the Sabbath of February 6, 2021. The Lord passed by and said, Sleep on now, thy good and faithful servant. Baron Edmund Cowan is survived by his loving wife, Vida, his son, Edmund Barron, his grandchildren, Hilary Chio Marie, and Edmund Barron Johnson, his siblings, Lancelot, Elaine, and Alvin, a host of nieces and nephews, brothers-in-laws and sister-in-laws, many loved ones that he considered his sons and daughters, who referred to him as Dad Cowan, and their children who called him Grandpa Cowan, along with a multitude of friends. Today, I say thank you, Dad Cowan, for being my dad. I love you and will miss you forever. Um, it's a privilege to be here, everyone, and as we generalize um, Brother Cowan, I just have a short reflection. Um, I was asked to give this by Eddie and his mom, and it's a privilege. And This is how I want you to remember. I met Brother Cowan when I was 14 years old in Bethesda, New York, in Bethesda Church in Amityville, New York. And one thing I liked about Brother Cowan was that um, he really had a love for young people. Sometimes older people are scary to teenagers. And so in my reflection with Brother Cowan, I want you to remember this, G-I-M. He was a Jim, G-I-M. The G stands for gregarious. He was very gregarious, which means friendly, outgoing. I think everybody would agree. Jim, G, gregarious. The I stands for, he had a lot of inquiries. He was inquisitive, not in a negative way, but he was inquiring always to know. Where are you going to school? What are you going to be doing in the future, right? That's, that's Brother Cowan. So the G is gregarious. The I is inquisitive or a lot of inquiries. And then the M is what my daughter gave me. I spoke to my daughter yesterday. Um, she's in school or else certainly she would be here. And I asked my daughter, I said, have you ever spoken to Brother Cowan? Um, and she said, yes, Dad. And I said, more than just hello or whatever. I said, have you really spoken to Brother Cowan? And she said, yes, Dad. And she had just come out of nine hours of examinations yesterday. And I said, real quick, give me a word. I said, give me three words um, that you would use to describe Brother Cowan. And she said, Dad, my brain is fried. I just came out of nine hours of exams. My roommates are asking me what's wrong with me. I'm almost like a drunken person. But she said one thing. The first words that came out of her mouth was that Brother Cowan was motivating, was motivating. And the conversation that he had with her was that he was looking forward to, he was, he was very proud of her for being in dental school. And um, he was looking forward to see her graduate, and she, she does in three months. And so, in closing, I just want to, again, give my condolences to the family and everyone gathered here. And as you think about Brother Karen, Cowan, just remember Jim, gregarious, 
inquisitive, and most definitely motivating. May God bless you. Before we sing our hymn, Under His Wings, for those who did not know, I'm privileged to share with you that Brother Cowan was more than just a member of the church. Brother Cowan, as most of you know, was also one of the staff members of the church. He was a team member of the church. In fact, in my entire nine plus years here, uh, he has served as one of our team members. And so today, Sister Cowan, Eddie, Hillary, and Johnson, I, I want you to know that in addition to my being here, all of the pastors are here today. Our executive assistant, uh, Tiffany Williams, who came to love Brother Cowan, she too is here today. Our executive officers of the church, uh, Brother Jacobs, who has served as our treasurer, Sister Lang, who has served as our clerk, they are here today. So not just as church members, but as colleagues of Brother Cowan. Uh, we want you to know that our thoughts and our prayers are with you. Uh, I could always count on good conversation with Brother Cowan. And the only way I could escape some of his inquisitive questions was to say, Brother Calvin, it's time for you to get back to work now. Uh, but then the day would be sweeter when at the end of the day, Sister Cowan would come to pick up Brother Cowan. And she would make it sweeter because she would have a nice little, little container of Callaloo for me. So he knew he couldn't be hard on me. Because if he were hard on me, Sister Calvin would be hard on him. But as a staff, as a team, it will never be the same. Because one who has been with us in this journey will no longer be at work with us. But we want you to know we thank you for sharing him with us. Uh, there are many unsung heroes of the Oakwood University Church. People see myself, they see the other pastors, they see elders, deacons, deaconesses, clerks, treasurers, and musicians and singers up front. But there are many unsung heroes of our church who make our church what it is. Brother Cowan was one of those unsung heroes. And for that family, we say thank you. Thank you for sharing him with us. The songwriter said, under his wings I am safely abiding. Though the night deepens and tempests are wild, still I can trust him. I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me, and I am his child. With masks on, we will sing this verse in this course as we prepare today to hear words of comfort immediately following this congregational selection. Under his wings, I am safely abiding. Though the night deepens and tempests are wild, still I can trust him, No, he will keep me. He has redeemed me and I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings my soul shall love, safely abide for. 
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, for the next couple of moments, I ask that you speak words of comfort to this wonderful family. Remove me and may they see thee. And may they be comforted by the fact that, Lord, you are with them even right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. Now to use this text at a service like this is very unique. In fact, somebody might be standing saying or watching, why is Pastor Bird using a text about judgment at a graveside service? Judge not that ye be not judged for a eulogy. But we often use this text to remind people that they should be careful at pointing their fingers at others when they've got three finger, fingers pointing back at them. We use this text to promote general Christian behavior by saying, don't pick on other people. Don't jump on other people's failures or criticize their faults unless you want the same treatment because the same critical spirit has a way of boomeranging and coming back to get you because what goes around comes around. While it is true that what goes around comes around, I'd like to offer today a different perspective of this text. While we shouldn't judge, the challenge here is not to judge motive because we're not omniscient, we're not all-knowing, we don't know the reason or motive why people do some of the things that they do. But there is a difference when it comes to judging action. Based on someone's actions, we can say that was right or that was wrong. Because if somebody shoots somebody in cold blood and they were not in imminent danger, we can look at that and say, that was wrong. Now today, I am not God. You are not God. We are not God. Let God be God. So while we can't judge motive, today we can judge action. And one of the ways we can judge people's actions is by judging what they love. And when I think of Baron Cowan, there are five things that come to my mind that I know he loved. Number one, he loved the Lord. You could tell by the way he talked. You could tell by the way he lived, the way he acted. You could tell by the way he preached. But someone could be saying, Pastor Bird, Brother Cowan wasn't a preacher. But understand, the greatest sermon ever preached is not what somebody says, but how someone lives. He lived for Jesus. He loved the Lord. But number two, Brother Cowan loved his church. Because he loved Jesus, he loved his church. Jesus established a church down here on earth for us to live and serve through. In fact, the church is the only institution that Jesus founded. So if you love Jesus, you can't help but love his church. Throughout his life, not just here in Huntsville, but throughout his life, even in New York and everywhere in between, he was at church. When the church doors opened, he was there. Sabbath school, he was there. Divine worship, he was there. Revival time, he was there. He epitomized the biblical admonition that I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. In fact, as a staff member, a team member at the church, let's be clear that he did what he did not for the money because we all know you won't get rich working for the church. But he did it because he loved the church. He wanted his church to be in proper order, looking good, smelling right. He loved his church. Number three, he loved the Bible. How do I know? 
because he would always come to me with these questions, strange, peculiar questions about the Bible. Questions, by the way, that I knew he already knew the answer to. But he wanted to engage in good Bible discussion. He could quote scripture after scripture, verse after verse, line after line. You couldn't do that if you didn't love it. People all the time quote their favorite lines from TV shows, favorite lines from movies, favorite lines from books. You only do that if you like the line from the movie, like the line from the show, like the line from the book. Brother Cowan quoted the good book, the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Number four, Brother Cowan loved prayer. He believed in prayer. He believed prayer changed things. He believed prayer changed people. Because of his belief in the power of prayer, he walked by faith and not by sight. Prayer brought him through many situations. Prayer brought him through tough times. Prayer brought him through illness as oftentimes the doctors and all of us would marvel as how he was able to keep going in spite of what the doctors and medical science were saying. But I believe it was prayer. He found the answer to life and it was prayer. But then number five, he loved his family. Sister Cowan, he loved you. As the familiar expression says, you were the wind beneath his wings. You were the one who made him smile. You were the one who made him laugh. You were the one who brought him joy. And you were the only one who could get him told. You were his everything. He loved you. But not only did he love you, Sister Cowan, Eddie, he loved you. He loved you, his son. He would talk to me about you as a boy at the Amityville Bethesda School. He told me, I never told you this, that you were the class president of the eighth grade at that school. He was proud of that. He told me about you as a teenager at Pine Forge. And then he told me about stories of you at Oakwood, but I dare not tell him stories about us at Oakwood when we were in the dorm. But he told me. He loved you. And I believe so much that he loved you that he knew ultimately, as Pastor Weems said, that he and your mom would have to relocate to Huntsville and retire and be near you. He could have been and retired anywhere else. Could have been Georgia. Could have been Florida because Florida, he talked to me about your parents and retiring close to them, but he said no, Huntsville because Eddie was here. Eddie, he loved you. And while I know Brother Cowan loved Sister Cowan and I know he loved Eddie, we all know he loved his grandchildren. I don't know what it is about grandparents and their grandchildren. My parents would get that switch and wear me out, but it's something about their grandparents, children, they won't do. The same was true for Brother Cowan. He loved his wife, he loved his son, but Hillary and Johnson, you two were the apples of his eye. Hillary, I don't know what it was, but you, his first grandchild, you were the light of his life. Johnson, with the two T, S's. He loved you too, was proud of you. I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to be embarrassed, but when you graduated from eighth grade, he came up to me and he said, he's just like his daddy. Because Johnson, if you remember, you were the president of your eighth grade class. And he made sure he made that known to me. We can't judge motives, friends, but we can judge actions. And we can judge people 
by what they love. Brother Calvin loved the Lord. He loved the church. He loved the Bible. He loved prayer. And he loved his family. And now God has given him rest. He's just sleeping for a little while. Because after a little rest, there's going to be a reunion. What am I talking about? In the vocabulary of, God, vocabulary of God, there is no such word as goodbye. Because Jesus lives, one day those who have fallen asleep in him, one day they will live again. So death then, as we always say, is not a period, but only a comma in the story of life. Sister Calvin, I need you to remember what you told me. When I came by the house just before Brother Coward, Cowan's passing, you said, Pastor Bird, I'm okay. You said, because he's okay. Because you told me that his salvation was secure. And so you looked at me, I don't know if you remember, and you said, he can rest now. God has given Brother Calvin rest. And because of the life he's lived, God will give him his just reward. Revelation 22, 12 is clear. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man, woman, boy, girl, according as their work shall be. And when you love Jesus, when you live for Jesus, when you serve Jesus, when you serve and love others, your reward is a good reward. And so God is going to give us one day the reward of eternal life with him. World without end. Amen and amen. But it's not just rest. It's not just reward. God has also promised us a reunion. Not only will we have eternal life with Jesus, we shall be reunited with loved ones who love Jesus. Rest, reward, reunion. And so I'm reminded of that old Negro spiritual. Walk together, children. Don't get weary. There's going to be a great camp meeting in the promised land. In the promised land, we're going to see Jesus. And we will see our loved ones who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So family, Sister Calvin, Eddie, Hillary and Johnson, don't get weary in well-doing. Because if we faint not, we're going to receive our just reward. So let me close this way. The pastor tells the story of a young woman who was a member of his church but was critically ill in the hospital. The pastor went to visit this lady, but as she walked up the steps to as he walked up the steps to her hospital room, he saw her friends who told him that the young lady had just died. Two days later, the pastor was asked to conduct the funeral of this young lady. He went by the funeral home just before he was to go to the church for the funeral service. He went to the parlor where the casket was, where the flowers were, where family and friends were. He then saw the young lady's mother in the corner by herself. He took the mother's hand of the young lady and he tried to offer her some words of encouragement. But he didn't need to say anything. She put both of her hands on his and said, Pastor... What would I do if I didn't know Jesus? The good thing is, this mother who had just lost her daughter knew Jesus. The good thing, Sister Cowan, is you know Jesus. The good news is, Brother Cowan knew Jesus. And while I can't judge motives, can judge actions. He loved the Lord. He loved his church. He loved the Bible, loved prayer, and loved his family. And because of this, he's receiving rest. He will get his reward, and there will be a reunion. For as much as God in his infinite love, has allowed Brother Baron Edmund Cowan to fall asleep in him. We lovingly and tenderly commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The solemn and blessed hope that one day this mortal will put on immortality. 
This corruptible will put on incorruption. And death is going to be swallowed up. How do we know it's going to be swallowed up? Because we have victory in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labors are not in vain. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. God, today we can't wait for you to come. We can't wait till the day that you break through the clouds. We are thankful that Brother Cowan lived a life through which we can mimic so that when we see him again, we will see him in peace. Comfort us. God, comfort his wife, his son, his grandchildren and family. But most importantly, God, remind us again that one day soon it will be a day of rejoicing. And when we see Jesus, we together with Brother Cowan will sing and shout the victory. We're thankful for that victory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Precious memories, how they linger, how they ever flood my soul. In the stillness of the midnight, sacred scenes will unfold. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your support given to the Cowan family on today. We would also like to thank Pastor Bird for his comforting words. Let's all give him a hearty amen. Family, as you embark on the days, weeks, months, and years ahead, please trust and believe that you will see your dearly departed again in the stillness of your midnight. May the roads rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall soft upon your fields. And until you all meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. On behalf of the management and staff of Royal Funeral Home, we would like to say thank you for entrusting us with your loved one. May the comfort of love and love of God keep you in the days ahead. Family, continue to love on each other and be there for each other and take comfort in the loving memories of your beloved. And as we say here at Royal, when only memories remain, let them be beautiful.
To the Cowan family, our thoughts, our prayers are continually with you, not just this day, but in the coming days. To all that have come to support, thank you. And I want to say, folk, we've been out of here a lot lately. Love everybody. Treat everybody right. Stop majoring in minors because there are some things in life that are just not that deep. Let's love the Lord and love each other so one day soon we can be united with Jesus and reunited with our loved ones. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace now and peace forevermore. Amen. On behalf of the family, we would like to thank Royal Funeral Home for a job well done as always. Brother Gerald Kibble and Oakwood Memorial Gardens for again a job well done as always. And specifically
I know he likes me. Okay. Yeah, you know, you said the words that you love him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ye